It's uh, it's it's Thursday, January 11th. We have gotten, holy smokes, um, so many applications now. I think 66 open GitHub applications um, and Airtable forms, I think, are somewhere in the like 40s or 50s, maybe, um, which is a hoot. Uh, so we have a couple of people here that may have some questions um, specifically on the line. Uh, we'll take those um and then i've also got some like questions that have come up a couple of times from various people um so we can touch on that stuff too but i think uh, i think ian was the was first in so we'll kick it to him and see if he has any um uh, pressing questions uh yeah sure um so I think the thing that I was just most confused about was there are a couple of sections where it specifically asked what tools we're going to use for various things. And I'm not super familiar with the existing process. And so I don't know what tools exist to do those things. Uh, and so knowing what my options are will help me better answer the question. Super. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. Let me um, pull up something. Um, so I'm going to pull up one that, uh, we, uh, hope is like one of our exemplars and which is coming from, um, KZ, which is in the open public data set pathway. Uh, and that one, we are still, um, pasting back in, we had a Zapier integration that didn't work for us. Um, so we're still pasting back in. Uh, people's replies, like we said we would do, so that people can see other people's replies and audit those. Um, but we have had to do it a little bit more manually using some um, Airtable concatenation formulas, uh, which is just not um, not ideal. But that being said, there are some available tools. Let's see if there's an easy way to pull this up um and enumerate them not really if we look at the actual um question on the application around tooling mm -mm -mm, for tooling and bookkeeping uh, question number 34, client discoverability um, and applications. So this is how will clients potentially find you and submit an application. Currently, we have our landing page, fillplus.storage. That is a place where we as a program have our sort of programmatic roadmap. We direct clients to that, and we are going to be updating that to have um, you know, where it says apply for data cap. Our goal is to then say, if you want to be on that, we can connect you in and have you give a short blurb about who would be eligible. And then you could say, you know, if you are this type of client, this is our sort of allocator pathway. A client would land on that homepage, be able to apply for data cap, see the different allocators that are discoverable on that, that have opted in and click one to apply. And so the question here is like, what tool will you use if you are going to use the existing tooling um, by the, um, it's kind of the nucleated team is going to be the primary builder of that. The foundation is going to be um, advising and, and adding uh, funding for that as well and helping those things get built. So client discoverability and clients to submit an application. That's the fillplus.storage homepage currently due diligence and investigation. What tools will you use to perform your diligence and your investigation? Right now, a lot of that is happening on GitHub. A client opens an application, that application is on GitHub, you go view their application. How are you going to review your clients and perform diligence on them? Where will you do that investigation work um, and capture evidence of it? Bookkeeping, if you have 10 clients, and you give them some amount of data cap, where will you keep track of the clients that you have worked with and the amount of data cap you have given out? Again, if you use a GitHub repo, there's a running list. If you use a spreadsheet, if you use a bespoke database, at any point in time, 
if you are building this service to offer this resource, you should probably be doing some kind of bookkeeping to know I was given five PIBs by the root key holders. I have allocated out one PIB. I have this much runway left before I need to request more, right? So if you're building a service, um, it would make sense that you would have some way of tracking that uh, for yourself. We have historically had people do that through, um, like I said, through GitHub, as well as through the data cap stats dashboard, they can see a running log. Um, On-chain message construction. This has been the um, notary registry tool where notaries sign in with a ledger. This has been um, in existence since early days of the program. Um, they sign in with a ledger. They see open applications that are ready to receive data cap. They say approve. It constructs a message. This is tooling built by Kiko to construct the message that they then approve on their ledger device. Are you going to use that set of tooling or are you going to use some other? Someone may say, I'm just going to manually construct all the messages using my own Lotus node. And I'll, I'll do it myself. But if you're going to send data cap, that's a message on chain. You need to somehow have a tool to do that. Um, Client uh, deal-making behavior. What tools will you use to track the behavior of your clients? Data cap stats is our dashboard where we're capturing that information. Are you going to use that as your source of truth or some other dashboard? Or are you going to track it yourself or use some other smart contract tool that you build? Um, how will you track your overall health? Again, if, if the governance team uh, is awarding you five PIBs of data cap and this is some service that you are offering as an entity as a team in this ecosystem, you probably have some objectives, some kind of key results, some way to say, yeah, I'm reporting up to my bosses. I'm reporting over to somebody that I we, we invested this much money to be an allocator. In the first month, we got this many applications. From those applications, this many were approved. From the ones that were approved, you know, this many have gotten second allocations. Are you tracking your health? as a as a pathway um, disputes discussion uh, dispute discussion and resolution we have the trust and transparency team previously um, has used a uh, open uh, notion document people can submit disputes view those disputes discuss them and resolve them are you going to have a google form are you going to have a type form where are you going to allow your clients to raise a dispute with you um, or allow other allocators uh, to raise disputes against you. If, if a client says, I applied for data cap and you never got back to me, um, I'm not getting an answer, or you rejected my application, but I really think it, it is right, or you said you'd send me 100 tibs of data cap, you only sent me 50, where are you going to track that? Um, Notion is one place. Again, a Google Doc could be another. Uh, and then community updates and comms. If you are going to change the rules of your program, or if you are launching a new version of your dashboard, if you are a allocator that uses smart contracts and you're rewriting some of your smart contracts, where will you update the community on these like changes? How will you, you know, share out? Hey, we have a we have something coming down the pipe. Um, please go read more about it here. We have usually used uh, Slack for this. Maybe you choose to use Slack as well. Maybe you want to stand up a blog post or a Medium page. Um, so again, those are some of the things that have existed. Uh, some of those things will be maintained and continue to persist, and we will work to continue open sourcing those. And others, you may say, yeah, I, I want to build my own, or that tool doesn't really work for me. Um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use a different platform or not opt in. So question 34 has sort of those enumerated out as categories, and to each of those categories we have had um, previously a open source tool available. Does that answer your question? Uh, um, yeah, I mean 34 seemed pretty straightforward to me. I was mostly curious about 35, which it sounds like you yeah. kind of answered as part of 34. Um, right. I. Yeah, I, I guess, so for us, I, and I don't know how relevant this is to other allocator pathways, but for us, we have an existing, we're, I'm part of the 
Foundation Social Impact Team. Oh. We work with all of our social impact projects. Um, and we have yeah. a pre-existing, very extensive due diligence process we do with them before we sign a contract to work with them. And so right. are you expecting us to make that information public? Are you expecting us to do like a second application process that just makes public the fact that they're asking for data cap or can we like just get an email from them since we talk to them on a weekly basis and so, use that as their application so 34 is saying what will you use to perform diligence and investigation and so that is a place mm -hmm. where you would say before we work with clients this is our diligence process we have meetings with them, they submit this much documentation, we do sanctions checks, we we are engaging in a business operation with a client. In order to do so, we are required to perform diligence on them. And here is some of the ways that we do that. And that's where 34 says like, what does your diligence look like? 35 then says, will you use the open source tooling? Will you use this? the additional diligence tools that that we have built. And you could say, you know, yes, we will use some of them. No, we will not use all of them. And mm -hmm. then the question of, do we have to submit, a, do, do these people have to submit another application? You have to be tracking and doing bookkeeping in a place where somebody could come in, someone like myself on the governance team or an auditor who says, the social impact team has used four out of their five PIBs. They are ready for more. We need to go audit how they used those four PIBs. They claimed they were going to give it out in a certain way to a certain type of client. They claimed that they would keep are diligence records here. I now, as an auditor, need to go look at those four PIBs of behavior. So where can I go to see that? Does that mean that I can go to a repo where it has application requests that you put in on behalf of your clients with the whatever amount of information is necessary? So that doesn't mean that you need to open up your entire bookkeeping or your entire you know, intellectual property or your entire amount of due diligence or all of the email addresses to the entire public. We are not expecting that the whole wide world should be able to see all of your diligence and investigation. However, an auditor like myself or someone else on the governance team needs to be able to see enough information in a consistent place to be able to say, you claimed you were going to perform diligence and capture this information. You gave out four PIBs of data cap. I need to be able to go look, where did those four PIBs go? Did you actually perform that diligence? Show me your work. And it's the same kind of mindset that we have had for if you are a notary and a client comes to you and says, I promise this is who I am. I promise I want to do deal making in this way. And I promise I have this much data available. As a notary, you say, I'm going to trust you, and then I'm going to go verify after you've started doing deal making. So I'm going to ask you qualitative questions. You're going to give me answers. You're going to then get quantitative behavior, and I'm going to go back and verify it. As an allocator, you're telling the governance team and the world that we should trust that you will do diligence in a certain way, and it will be available for audit in a certain place. So again, we don't expect you to, for example, put everyone's email addresses on GitHub. I would actually advise you not to put those on GitHub um, because it can be and is uh, publicly scraped. So if you say we are going to have a um, a private, uh, semi-private bookkeeping and diligence database, it will be shared and made available to members of the governance team um, during an audit. And that is where we will keep, you know, the additional information um, around who our clients are. And but fundamentally, the question in the application is saying, how do you know that you should work with this person? How do you know that this person is eligible to be in your beta? This is another question that came up in a couple other applications around KYC. And one of the examples was, 
we don't do KYC just like Dropbox doesn't do KYC, to which I am really left scratching my head because I have made a Dropbox account and in doing so, I had to give Dropbox information. They asked for my name, they asked for my email address, they had me make an account. They collected information on me to know that I am a potential client when I created an account with them. That is KYC. So Dropbox knows something about me in order to work with me. If I'm paying Dropbox, they know more about me because now if they know credit card information, billing information, where I'm located, Dropbox has to collect information in order to have a client. So Dropbox has done KYC. So the question that we're asking is, if you are Dropbox, what is your KYC? If you are running a closed mm -hmm. beta, who are your clients? How will you let someone into your closed beta and know that they're not a Sybil, a sanctioned individual, someone trying to engage in defrauding you or money laundering? How do you know as a person running a business in this ecosystem that the people you are doing business with are trustworthy? That's what we're asking for, right? When we ask for like, tell us what your KYC is, we're trying to understand that. So when you say, yes, we, you know, we have a long extensive process as a social impact team or as a person building a, a paid service on this, our diligence process in order to be accepted into our beta, we have, you know, this many meetings, we pull this many records, we check these kinds of business licenses. Those are things that you are already doing. We're not asking for you to do some like over the top additional amount. If you are already doing KYC, if you are already doing diligence and you are already capturing that somewhere, you are already doing bookkeeping. If these people are paid customers, and again, Ian, this is less for you, but it's similar. Mm -hmm. If these people are paid customers into your service, you should probably be doing bookkeeping on who's paying you and where they're located. And if their account is in arrears, you would want to know that information. And so we are just asking, how are you capturing that information and where? And we are not saying that all of that information must be made publicly available to everyone. We need to know, are you capturing this? What does it look like? And if we need to audit portions of it, what will we be able to audit and where would we go to do so? Um, so that's like sort of a long winded thing that gets at your question, but also I think hopefully addresses um, some other people that were asking similar questions around like, we don't, we don't perform KYC, to which I think, I, I am confused. Like even when you use the auto notary I, yeah. for Glyph, they're performing KYC, the information is your GitHub account, right? We OAuth using a GitHub credential. That is KYC. Um, Got okay. it. So I think but were... to go back to like 34 and 35, like, will you use some of the open source tooling? Yes, we will use certain pieces of it. Um, we will not use these other pieces. Uh, and, you know, you can explain from end to end. We use a separate database for tracking our social impact project partners. It's a Notion Airtable. Um, you know, it's private and it, and it records more than just uh, information about people that are ready to receive or utilize data cap. Are, are there guidelines somewhere on what information has to be public all the time? What information has to be available to auditors on requests and what information we just need to know internally and we don't need to share? Uh, no, because it's too... It's like too broad and inconsistent across different people. As far as like what needs to be public all the time, you, for transparency, that's like what we are hoping to capture in this application. How transparent are you going to be to other public community members? Because if you are showing up to this ecosystem and wanting to be a trusted fiduciary, other members of this ecosystem should be able to audit your actions as a trusted fiduciary of the network and say you received five pibs of data cap and you turned around and made a hundred allocations and all that we can see because it's on chain is your notary address and those hundred clients and who those hundred clients worked with and that's 
on chain, that is the only thing that we have access to. How sh how do we, other members of the community, know that those are trustworthy interactions? And so there needs to be some amount of public diligence, applications, bookkeeping that says, you know, we worked with this project, this project, you know, had this client address, they wanted to work in these different places. And so there needs to be some amount of information that is available and then deeper audits um, need to be available to the governance team in order to say the governance team has to trust and then verify if we gave you five PIBs, should we give you more data cap for you to continue building this pathway? Okay. So yeah, I guess I'm still trying to understand what the to be a transparent and above board allocator what is the right level of information we need to be sharing? It sounds like it, like datacapstats.io tracks all of our disbursements for us. So we don't necessarily need to provide more information about that. We would need to provide information about who is associated with each wallet that we're allocating to. Um, how, what, like when I, when I hear KYC, because I've worked in financial services stuff before, I think like anti-monitoring, money laundering laws, which are significantly higher than yes. what you were talking about with Dropbox. So right. when mm -hmm. I'm making this information public, what do I need to make public? Is it just the name of the organization? Is it who at the organization I'm working with and talking to? Is it yeah. what dates they request? What, what I would say is go look at the large data set repo and look okay. at some of the applications in there. And and you'll see this is some of this is the information that we are expecting an applicant to submit that tells us who you are, how you want to use Filecoin, what is your data, what is the deal-making behavior that you're going to do. Why should the entire network trust what you're claiming and subsidize this client address? And so if if you are, and, and this is again where I think like the social impact team is like a great example, you get to say, we have this project partner and Ian, all of the like applications into your repo could come from you. You could say, I'm Ian, I'm opening this application on behalf of, you know, project partner uh, XYZ. Here's a link to their website. Uh, this is what they're doing. Here's like a short summary of what they do. This is the type of data. And this is the type of deal making we expect. And this is the client address we're going to use to track. Um, and then you as the notary allocator are awarding data cap to that client address. And if you are also building the tooling that's helping do the data onboarding, it would make sense that you are managing parts of that client address for them. And then they're downstream making deals. Now, then when I go back to audit, I see a paper trail, right? And that paper trail is coming from you. But then if there's a question about it, I could say, Ian, you claimed that it was project XYZ. I, I am going to audit you, show me in a semi-private forum, you know, the email addresses or your deeper diligence that gives me confidence you actually are working with this person and you're not just claiming, oh yes, I am Ian and I'm working with the McDonald's Corporation of America. And we have copies of all of our receipts from all of our stores. You could easily say that in GitHub and it would look believable. And then when I go to audit it, you have nothing to show me that's like, yes, here's some emails back and forth with, you know, proven email addresses, like that sort of thing. So the emails, the further diligence, that does not need to be public. That needs to be made available when there is an audit. The public thing is like, who am I working with? What is their type of data? Why should the community care about this? There's also a way for the community to say, oh, this social impact allocator is great. Look at all the different examples of things they are bringing to the network. So this is again, kind of that storytelling opportunity where you then get to leverage that as your own pathway and say, you know, I'm building a service on this. Look at these other people that I have worked with. Look at the like caliber of service that I have provided um, and the types of clients that I have. And someone else can then say, oh yeah, that looks great. I would like to work with you. Okay, that's mostly get to it. Yeah, the only last one was the VPN question. What tools are available for tracking VPN usage? Um, so there are some tools that are being built uh, to track VPN usage. I am really excited 
uh, and would like for there to be additional tools that get built around um, cryptographically proving location. I think that from a um, client-centric viewpoint, I think this is really interesting and important. I think that if I were a client coming to this ecosystem and wanting to engage in distributed deal making, I think it's the whole value prop of Filecoin is I can cryptographically have proof of replication and proof of space time. I know that my data is still there and hasn't been manipulated. Another thing that would be really important to me is I know that when I engage with a service that I want my data in a certain geopolitical region, I can cryptographically prove that that is true. And I'm not, as a client, I'm not getting hoodwinked and having my data be actually spoofed behind a different VPN. As a client, I think that we want these services. As a storage provider, I understand why certain people use VPNs. I understand why certain clients want to use VPNs. The tooling that we have right now is still, you know, we're still figuring out like best ways to do this, to like uncover is this storage provider behind a VPN? If they are behind a VPN, where are they most likely physically located based on additional information? Um, and again, the, the questions are really around be, be as transparent as you can be. If you're going to use a VPN for business purposes or for um, you know, geopolitical reasons, be upfront about that. Like we are using a VPN, our data centers are in these regions uh, and we're going to be using vpns um as far as like what uh what tooling will be ready or or more advanced in the next couple of months um i don't have a great answer to that there's a lot of other things that are higher priorities around you know getting other tooling um plugged in for all of the allocators to use and getting sort of more of the compliance and auditing tooling um, and so some of the existing compliance tools around CID checker, um, the AC bot, like those various tools, uh, those are still in development. And we have teams that are working on some of them are on this call. Uh, so I don't have a, I don't have more information or detail around the sort of tooling that will be made available to allocators uh, to manage the VPN usage of downstream storage providers. Cool. Um, Shinan, did you have a question? Yes, I have two questions. Awesome. Um, so one, um, does Allocator have to grant data cap to clients or can it serve deals directly from the Allocator address on behalf of the client? Um, I think on chain, I could be wrong. I think on chain, you the root key holder will, there's a message that says from F80, award data cap to a to an address and that could be a multi-sig and that address is then has a set amount of data cap and that address now is listed on the um, uh, verifier table so that address now has the rules of being a, a notary a verifier from there that address has the ability to send data cap from its address to another address okay I don't know if you can send that data cap to your own, to self-referential to the same address. And I don't know if you can do a deal from the address that you use as a notary. I don't know if you could do a deal proposed message and attach data cap from that same address. Um, believe it or not, I am uh, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a cryptographic uh, wizard. I'm not a coder. Um, and so parts of this are like way beyond my scope and skill set. Um, just yesterday, we had people asking about how to get data cap on Calibnet um, so they can do testing. Uh, I think that could potentially be a great way to test this out. If the if the root key holders send data cap to one address, can that one address be the same one that does dual messages directly out? I think the answer is probably no. I also think that from a bookkeeping uh, standpoint, I think that that will get messier for you because I think that what would be better is to say, I have my bank account and from my bank account, who am I working with? And I want to, if I'm going to stand up a smart contract with this client, 
I want to attach an amount of data cap to that client. And then that client with that amount of data cap is the one doing the deal making. And so I think that sectioning these things out, um, both from like a, a bookkeeping standpoint, um, but also just from a, if we are, if you are doing something in an automated way and you're saying, okay, I have one bank account where all five initial, all five pips of my data cap goes, and then I'm going to connect some kind of automated system to that major bank account. I don't love that idea. Like if it were me, I would want to gate that, right? If I'm building something with automated tooling and then suddenly someone's like, oh, great, I found a exploit or I'm going to, I'm going to spam it with, a, you know, hundreds of accounts. They could theoretically, if you don't build in programmatic stop gaps, they could drain out your whole five pib account because you didn't have a gate in place. And so again, not a computer scientist. I'm just trying to like think out how to do this. If it were me, I would rather say I've got a five pib account. I'm going to put one pib of it over here and connect my tooling to that. Worst case that happens, something goes off the rails, they've taken one pib, right? And then I've got evidence that shows, oh, this is where the gap was. This is where the issue was. I can I can close that hole before I send another one pib um, to that. Does that, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. The only thing I see the benefit of like uh, having a, one that can damage everything is that so you don't need to worry about like you over allocated something to one client you have to remove it um just extra dev work and monitoring that need to be in the automated flow but other than that yes you you the yeah. makes sense bookkeeping is a strong um strong advantage if we are like splitting uh, into, uh, actually grinding data cap to clients um mm -hmm. understand yeah i think it's i think you're right i think it's like it's a balancing factor tomato tomato and so i think this is also where we we want to find more of these needs and work with like the Lotus team and the FIPS teams to say like right now the remove data cap from client tool is kind of painful because it requires two notaries and then two root key holders to remove data cap from a client, right? But the problem is if we don't do that, you could see situations where like, let's say a, a person who is a notary goes rogue and just is like, well, I just want to remove data cap from clients that weren't mine. So now we would need to change the, the rules as written that say, oh, only a notary who gave the data cap could remove the data cap from that client. So this, it starts to get like more complicated to write the chain logic for removing data cap from a client address. Um, but you're exactly right. If you give data cap to a client and you over allocate, it is harder right now to change that rule and remove that data cap from that client address back to your pot. In fact, it is impossible to move it back from your pot. You would just burn the data cap from that client and then you would need to get more um, back into your pot from the root key holders. So, so that's like, yes, there are some like downstream complications. Um, we want, you know, we want to find like new of uh, these like edge cases and, and needs and be able to work, like I said, with with FIPS authors to change how data cap flow um, can I be structured. See. I see. Cool. My second question is about the timeline. Is there a ETA date for the launch of the allocator program? Yeah. So broad timeline. Um, we so january 20th is the deadline for applications we've already started working on figuring out how we're going to score all of them um the goal is that in this quarter uh we will be scoring and making our selections that then um before the end of this quarter q1 of 2024 our goal is to ratify and onboard those new allocators so ratification process um, is can be messy and painful. It requires a lot of messages back and forth with the root key holders. They have to audit the work that the governance team does. If I show up and I say, hey, root key holders, please give five PIBs to this address. I need to give evidence to the root key holders that the address I'm requesting is, you know, the social impact team, that address is ready to receive data cap. You know, the root key holders want to see that paper trail as well because they want to know that I, the governance team, like did this process correctly and am sending the right amounts to like the right people. 
because if they if I send it to the wrong address or there's a typo or you know I didn't verify that you know Ian's address was the one he really wanted to use and it's not a ledger address now again we have to go back and forth and remove so again it's just a whole thing then there's also the onboarding of getting them plugged into all the tooling so Q1 is when that should happen the goal is that in Q2, we will then transition to rolling applications. So my hope, my hope is that by the end of Q1, we have ratified and onboarded this V5 um, set of notaries. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Will. No questions. Great. Easy. Done. All nope, right. Everything makes sense. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, so um, so if that's the case, then I think that we've gotten a couple, I mentioned one already, but there've been a couple um, sort of things that have come up a few times just in like looking through and spot checking. And I just want to like reiterate and double click on this. Um, the part of this is like having a mindset um, where the governance team is asking you to submit an application to become a trusted fiduciary in the Filecoin network. Why should the whole network trust you with this amount of data cap, this sort of line of credit, this bank account? You know, if you are saying, we want to stand up our own small credit union, and here's the behavior that we are going to do. Here's how we are going to work as a small bank. Um, and you need to put some money in our vault. We want to know how you're going to assess customers that are coming to you. So if they're coming to you and they're doing paid deals with you, that's great. That's fantastic. But you're still having to capture some information about who those people are. Um, are you working with very small scale customers? Are you working with a really small closed beta of customers that look a certain way? If they are paid customers, that's fantastic. But but that still doesn't really tell us who they are or, or how you know that you should be taking their money, that you should be working with them, right? That they are a trustworthy paid customer. So the mindset here is if you, if you have this funnel or if you have this market segment or if you have this MVP or this business that you're building, then bring us in the fold. Not because you need to uncover all of your IP or all of your pricing structure or all of your, um, you know, disclosures, but because we need to be able to audit and demonstrate that, like, yes, this is this is legitimate. This is a legitimate set of business actions. We could trust that you have thought about this, that you are trustworthy, and that the people you work with downstream will also be real clients with real data doing real distributed deal making because it's like the program scope so we want to capture that information and then we need to capture enough of it and it needs to be going back to the game's point it needs to be transparent enough that if you say we want to be a small bank we're going to work with paid customers we're going to work with paid customers that look like this they're going to do deal making that looks like this and we think that in the next year we're going to do one exabyte, XB byte of deal making. The governance team is going to be like, okay, looks good. Here's five PIBs, go get started. The reason we set it at five PIBs is because that is a safe enough to try amount of data cap that if we, if we give out five PIBs to these different allocator projects, and some of them are not as great. Some of them, uh, you know, are not, don't have a full tech stack built out and ready. Some of them fail to launch. Some of them are, you know, trying to maybe just get an amount of data cap as quickly as possible and then run away with it. Um, some of them may not be the best project partners. In the scale of the overall network, five PIBs is a small, safe, uh, trustworthy amount of data cap to experiment with on these different clients. And we can intervene before then um, because it only requires the two root key holders um, to remove data cap from a notary rather than the four messages to remove data cap from a client. So it's faster to intervene on a notary if we discover that somebody is, is not a good actor. So we give five PIBs, you put it in your vault, you go start 
giving it out to your paid customers the way that you said you would. But I, or K Ray, or other members of the foundation, or you know, whoever is on the compliance and auditing team, when you have used four of your five PIBs, you're going to want more. And what I would love to do is I would love for this process to be automated. It won't be right away. And it won't be automated for the you know next couple of months. It's going to be a manual audit process where we are going to say, okay, I have a dashboard that I can go look at on data cap stats that tracks on-chain messages from your address and who you worked with. I can go connect those to your GitHub repo or to your Mongo database or like whatever tooling you use. Again, this is where it's like, if we use consistent open source tooling, it will make this compliance check a lot easier because I could build tools that look at one set of open source um, databases. If everyone uses a different Google spreadsheet for their bookkeeping, it might be way harder to do this compliance audit. We're going to find that out. But I need to go say, I gave you five, you've used four. Do you warrant an additional top up? What we would like to do is to have enough confidence that when we perform that compliance audit, that we feel safe doubling the amount of data cap coming from the root key holders um, to these allocator pathways. If it was five, you use four of it well. Now let's give you 10. You use, you get 10, you use eight of it. Uh, we do another audit. Now let's give you 20. Let's build you more capacity and more runway if you continue using it appropriately. If your pathway is very small and you're like, I'm never gonna be using, like, I'm not gonna use 20 PIBs um, in six months because I'm doing very, very tiny smart contract allocations. Great, we'll just we'll just set it at 20 and we don't need to double it every time. We'll give you the appropriate amount. But some people want hundreds of PIBs a month uh, because they anticipate that's their, that's their scale. Great, let's build towards that. But the governance team needs to be able to come in and audit your behavior. So that means we need to be able to say, is there an application for this? Um, is there a client? Is there real data? You know, what tooling do we have to say you were going to use um, this type of retrieval as a requirement for your pathway? You gave first allocations out to people. They engaged in deal making. The deal making that they engaged in did not meet your pathway requirements. You said in order to remain eligible for our pathway. You must work with storage providers that meet this level of retrievability. When you gave your first allocation, those clients that you worked with did not work with storage providers that meet that. Did you, as the allocator, jump in and say, hey, it looks like you are working with storage providers that are not meeting our expectations for retrievability. You need to either choose new storage providers, explain your situation, or you are not going to continue to get data cap from us. Again, if you're running a bank and you've got a vault and a customer walks in the door and you say, in order to be a customer of this bank, you need to invest your money in this way. And they say, okay, I'll do that. And then they walk out the door and they turn around and they go buy something else with it. And then they come back in and they say, can I have more money? The onus is on you running the bank to say, well, show me what you did with that money. Should I trust you more? And if the answer is like, no, you don't have any evidence or you went and did a wrong behavior that I don't agree with, um, I'm not going to give you an additional allocation. The governance team needs to be able to see evidence that you intervened, that you checked your clients and held them accountable and that you intervened and did not continue to give data cap. That's the type of audit that we're going to be doing to say, qualitatively, you claimed this is how your pathway would function. Now let's check quantitatively how you behaved. And then let's check other qualities of your health overall. So if you have paid customers, great. Is there any evidence? Are those paid customers doing paid deals on chain? Can we see that? Can you attach any funding to that? If you're the one managing this process, if you're managing the entire data cap allocation, deal making, and deal pricing for your clients, if you have obfuscated that whole thing from your clients, they just say, I have data, here's my data. Great. Your clients don't need to know all of the, how the sausage is made. 
But the governance team that's going to come in and audit you, they need to know how the sausage gets made. Because otherwise, why should we trust that you deserve more of a top up than an additional data cap? So that's where we're not expecting your clients to know the whole process, but you have to know the whole process and you have to be able to prove the whole process to an outside auditor, such as the governance team who's coming in to look at it. So that's like a little bit about a, a question, sort of, again, long winded, maybe philosophical take. Um, we have 10 minutes left uh, in this call. Um, I know uh, a couple of people had to had to drop. I don't think there were questions in um, necessarily in the Slack thread. We're going to be doing another one of these on the 16th. Um, that is, when is that? Tuesday? Ooh, yeah. Uh, next Tuesday. And that'll be in the um, evening, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Hopefully that can catch uh, a wider audience. And for people that are unsure and uncertain, if you were like, we we don't know what answers to put here, um, we're still working on getting other people's responses back into GitHub for you to look at and check and see how other people are applying to these questions, um, how they're building. Put yourself in the shoes of the governance team. Put yourselves in my shoes and say, do I think that Galen is going to view this as a robust and trustworthy application? Do I think that if I give this amount of information, I will be able to hold myself and my clients to this standard? Do I think that I will be able to demonstrate repeated trustworthiness of real clients with real data doing real distributed deal making? So the things that we care about as a program, can I prove that the people that I am working with are doing that? And how will I show that work clearly and cleanly so that I can continue to get these top ups and build more capacity? That's my advice. Um, and also, if you're like, man, I really don't know. I don't think I can get there by the 20th. Like we've said a couple of times, our hope is that once we onboard and ratify this round, we'll then move into rolling um, application cycle. And so then teams can see what's working, um, what teams are successful, what tools get built and launched, where is there a gap in the market that I could fit into? I'm going to apply later on once I've seen how this goes. Um, and the last thing that I'll say We've gotten um, questions from a number of people around, um, you know, should this be one application or multiple? Um, and my suggestion is that you should open um, applications, you know, a pathway where you could say all of my clients that are of a certain type would fit into this pathway. And so that might be all of my clients that are doing, um, you know, enterprise. Uh, private, uh, with a very small set of distributed um, storage providers, that would be a pathway. But my clients that are coming to me doing very, very small deal making because it's you know smart contract based and it's mostly automated allocations and those deals could go you know to any number of places. That might be a very separate pathway. And so a company. Let's say we have one pathway that's enterprise. We have another pathway that's very smart contract focused. Or they might say we have one pathway that is this one exact client because that one exact client has a very specialized set of behaviors. And it's going to be this one massive contract for this one massive client. That is like one pathway because we don't want to you know, mix up how that is a freight train uh, you know, on a single track. And then we have another pathway for all of these other, you know, private uh, enterprise clients that are at a much lower scale or a much lower tier. These are clients that are talking PIBs. This client over here is talking, you know, exabytes. I don't want to try and drive a freight train down a five lane highway, right? So I'm going to apply for those as separate pathways. Um, all right. We'll get this uh, posted up online. Thanks for everybody who was able to join. Um, any any closing questions from uh, Ian or Will? Super. All right. Have a great day.